In this talk, we present you how to debug boot issues on your laptop mainly, and present you just simple techniques to fix boot issues. It's beginner level, so we won't go very in depth. So this is Skywalker from Red Hat. Uh, <laughs> Raleigh. <laughs> yep, I'm uh, Kyle Walker. I'm a principal software maintenance engineer, and I work out of the Raleigh office, kind of. Uh, mostly remote, but uh, I do go into the office from time to time. <laughs> and I'm Renaud Metrich, uh, working from France, but depending on a, uh, a team in Czech Republic. So just before we start, <coughs> I will explain you what is our job in uh, software maintenance engineer at Red Hat. In a nutshell, so we hope that if there are so students here, we hope to hire some of you. <laughs> so in a nutshell, it's the best job in the world. So why? It's different from engineering. What we do is support. So we support frontline engineers, which are guys that take the calls mainly and try to solve issues from customer with uh, what they know from the customer. And these guys, Help, uh, <clears throat> call for help when uh, they just stuck. So that's what we call collaboration. Uh, so what we do, basically we do root cause analysis of issues based on system crashes or application crashes, uh, checking log files, stuff like that, trying to understand. Our first role first is to help the customer, so we try to provide some workarounds so that his production can continue. And in parallel, once we have some work around and try to find the root cause, we try to reproduce the issue so that engineering fix the issue. And of course, we cannot tell the engineering you need a 10 nodes cluster with this running, this load, etc. So we try to, to give simple, the simplest reproducer that we can. And finally, we create some knowledge-based articles that are uh, visible by everybody or customers, uh, usually it's only for customers uh, of Red Hat, and we explain the workaround and et cetera. Optionally, you can do more. So you can propose your own fixes to upstream or to the developers at Red Hat, and also you can work on upstream projects that you like. So it's very, you are very free of doing what, what Almost whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And it's, it's very interesting and rewarding work. Uh, getting out there and, and seeing after something's been developed, it's been packaged, it's been tested, it's been shipped, and then seeing all of the infinite ways that the average user will break it. <laughs> and from that moment, then hand over uh, sometimes amazing descriptions of deep dive technical information exactly where it's failing and why it's failing and what happened before and what they did as a result. And sometimes the, the, the problem description is, it's broken. <laughs> and so this job is really uh, around working with frontline to communicate to the customer, working with the customer directly, but getting our ourselves into a position where we know exactly what's going wrong. And whether we can fix that immediately, we can fix it in our stream, or we can fix it upstream, wherever the case may be, that's the job. And it's a lot of fun. So usual carry pass is uh, you can get hired as a frontline. That is the guy that answers the course and does the basic, uh, basic investigation. Uh, there are five levels for each associate, normal, senior principal, and senior principal. So the frontline, we call them TSE. And then you have also the backlines with the same, uh, same grading. And there are, of course, bridges between the two, and also a bridge to development, or to other, yeah. other job for that. All over the place from there. <laughs> so let's start with the agenda. So there's two parts there. We'll show you how the, the boot works the various phases, and then we'll show you how to debug issues with service initialization. So everything is based on system D here, of course. So the boot phases, I think you can go. Yeah, uh, so just to get started, it's 
just for audience awareness, it's vastly simplified. <laughs> uh, there's, there's gremlins and, and deep, dark magic in every bit of this. Um, but just to start off, we, we talk about the boot as uh, a, a lot of times there's, there's the boot process that we see on the screen, but that's actually after a lot of things have happened. Um, and CPU initialization, BIOS execution, UEFI, um, basically the hardware platform underneath us initializing, that all happens. And so debugging boot problems, it's really important to be aware of that. And sometimes when you're looking at a situation where it looks like there's no software running whatsoever, there's no software running whatsoever. <laughs> it could be hardware, it could be microcode, could be firmware, could be user configuration still, but on the hardware platform. It's on something that we can't interact with from the software side. Um, so we're not gonna get into that too much just because it's, it's really, it's interesting stuff, but it's, it's very long-winded. Um, but where we start is really around the, the bootloader. Um, talking about shim and the interaction with uh, the, the rest of the UEFI boot, uh, grub, um, kernel selection. Um, we go on from there with the NITRAMFS uh, operations, uh, why we need it. Um, and then the, the boot process, both pre-switch root and post-switch root. And then a little bit of a sightseeing tour around uh, various different problems that we see all the time in support and how we tackle them. Uh, so yeah, to start off, uh, there's a couple of fundamental differences at the outset when you're working with the boot process. Um, and it kind of boils down to these two, BIOS versus UEFI on the Intel platforms. Um, BIOS is really simple uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Usually, the end user picks a device to boot from, from their, their hardware configuration platform UI. Uh, and then what the BIOS does is it goes to the first sector of that disk and goes, I'm going to read the first uh, 512 bytes and then I'm going to execute it. And that's it. Everything else from that moment on is grub. And it's because grub puts a little bit of itself to get to the rest in that first sector. Um, yeah, it reads the, the master boot record, executes grub out of that first uh, uh, piece and loads the rest. Um, and grub does all of the hardware specific input output operations at that point. Um, so it's, at that point we, we have a fairly functional system, really. Um, UEFI is a little bit different. Uh, it's, the, the UEFI implementation is a lot more full featured um, it understands the EFI partition, the FAT file, uh, file system type. Uh, it load, looks for and then loads the shim. The shim being the, the piece that is signed for secure boot, um, and for non-secure boot it just defaults back to the, the next uh, UEFI stub uh, image. But in the secure boot, in, boot instance we have the shim there so that uh, we can validate the boot all the way along. A um, lot of detail there, but basically what it boils down to is uh, if you wanted to release a new version of Grub and you didn't have the shim there, you'd have to go somewhere else to get it signed. And with the shim being in place, it's trusted from the, the primary key, uh, it's validated, signed, and then shim, there's another downstream key that we sign subsequent grub iterations with, and that way when we get new updates, we don't have to go through the whole signing operation over again. We can do it in our build chain. Um, shim then executes grub. Uh, but there's also a couple of other interesting bits there. Uh, anyone who's familiar with uh, kernel module, secure uh, boot and kernel module operations, um, shim is actually where a lot of the, the last piece that is missed falls into place. Because when you uh, create a kernel module and you sign it, you have to have a way of trusting that key. And shim is the thing that does that for you. It installs it into the, the uh, machine operator key ring, all that stuff. But shim is where all that happens. All the trust uh, starts kicking off. Um, and then again, grub relies on UEFI functions to, to operate. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so the bootloader, the bootloader, why do you need this? It's just to select the kernel you want to boot and the associated parameters. It from FS, boot device, console, etc. So, <clears throat> Grub, to be able to do that, to execute the kernel with a parameter, it presents you with a menu, which is well known, and that menu is collected from slash boots, where it's stored, and typically, Grub has some, is able to, it, it knows five systems, so it must know XT4, XFS, etc., to be able to read slash boot, and, but it doesn't know everything. For example, multipass is not needed, because it, a Grub will just read from one pass, and it's at the BIOS level, or UFI, that will choose which pass you will boot. And typically, when something goes wrong, you get this nice picture, a nice prompt, and nothing. <laughs> and that's where most people panic, uh, especially end users who aren't very familiar with Grub operations. Uh, Grub 2 is actually a really decent interpreter. Uh, it, it actually, uh, or uh, CLI runtime environment. Yeah. Um, you can do an awful lot from Grub, as demonstrated. Yeah, so this is from, so if this has been recorded, it's not live demo. Basically, we are the Grub prompt. From there, you are not lost, because there's a help first. You can just type help. And there are a lot of commands that should help you bring up the system. Typically, you have cat, which enables you to read a file and check the content. You have tab completion, so you, you cannot, you, you don't need to just uh, know the path to the file, just hit tab, and that's quite simple. You have some nice commands like ls, etc., to see what's, what's on your system. And here, typically, we didn't boot, we check why. We were checking for grub.cfg, and in fact, it's an empty file. That's why it's, it was not booting. So thanks, for example, through config file, you can load some alternate grub file or specify the parameter manually. But here, we had some original file that we can call. And from there, you get the, the grub menu. So the root cause being the config file was renamed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a it was empty. empty one. Yeah, it was empty. So when this is taken from a real example, uh, this happens typically having a, an empty grub file when you have some hardware reset just while performing an update. And uh, on physical system, if you have just a hardware reset, the, the file didn't reach safe storage. You, you lose it. On VMs, that's, that's the same if you just kill your VM. So that can happen, and that also happens during in BIOS mode when you play with the slash boot partition. Say you reformat your disk because you, you want to increase the size of your slash boot partition or move it. Then, because Grub has internal, is internally stored near the, the partition table, you can have such a bug. So how to fix this? Well, you can use, you can fix that from the menu, but it's really for, for experts, I would say. So the best thing to do is just boot the DVD on, in rescue mode, or boot a, a USB skip um, key with a rescue mode, and from there you have all the commands necessary for UFI. Typically you will play with EFI boot, boot manager, and for BIOS, you will play with Grub2 install or Grub2 MK config to rebuild the Grub menu. And so, say now you have your, your menu, what happens next? So what happens next is you select your boot entry, and you will, Grub will load the kernel and it from FS in memory, and then it will execute the kernel. And you can go. Yeah, and uh, from here we can uh, then see the next part that usually fails. Um, uh, in this example, we have uh, kernel mount the uh, init MFS as its root device from memory. Uh, so at this point, the kernel image is looking for the root FS, and it can't find it. Uh. So we have a demo for that. Uh, yeah. 
So it just boots the system. <coughs> Come on. OK, here, that was some indication, but usually you don't see that because it doesn't pause. So your kernel boot, it tries to load your initramfs as its root device, and it just fails. So you get a, a nice kernel panic at the end. Yeah, you get a kernel panic with a, a really interesting message. Uh, VFS unable to mount root fs on unknown block. It actually couldn't find the root <laughs> at all. All right, from, from there we get into the init ramfs. What is it, why do we need it? Um, lot of history there, but basically the, the end in, intent is f you get this really cool uh, chicken or the egg problem uh, with really complicated systems. The more complicated and more functional, feature rich uh, the, the end runtime environment is, the harder it is to actually get it online. So what you end up with is a need for an init ramfs, which is basically a pared down version of the running system state uh, that you can make available to that initial kernel as it initializes. You get a lot of things like kernel modules, uh, configuration, uh, uh, system D actually in the pre-switch root operation. Uh, you get a bunch of different things in order to basically bootstrap that system into a, a functional enough state to get access to the rest of the box. Uh, so yeah, it uh, is basically responsible for getting the root uh, file system into sysroot. Uh, it knows what to do from the kernel command line arguments. Uh, so what you end up in a lot of case, cases with is uh, after you install, uh, you'll have this root directive which tells it where to look. Uh, and then you'll have a couple of other funny directives. Uh, the ones off the end are actually uh, parsed by Drakit. Uh, and actually delays things. Um, as the system is coming up, modules are being loaded, uh, storage is being initialized, uh, not all the storage, but as things are coming up, you actually get these race conditions uh, that, that pop in, where the system is kind of ready, but it's not ready for the next step. Uh, so in this case, what we actually say is, uh, the root is on uh, VG rel and logical volume root, um, read only, uh, just for the pre-switch root. Um, and then you have uh, indicated that the LV for rel root is one we need to wait for. If that's not there, sometimes it will boot and sometimes it won't. That's a really ugly problem to have. Um, this is another ugly problem that you can run into. Uh, in this instance, every once in a while, uh, you rename things, you uh, uh, move logical volumes around, and you get into this state a long time later, um, which is that it's saying that these particular logical volumes don't exist. It's a Drake at timeout behavior. I think we have a, a demo for that too, right? Yeah, exactly. So let's just place the demo online. <coughs> well, that works. Yeah. So the system is booting, but before switching root, it discovers some devices, and then Drake at waits for the root device to come up. Of course, so. It takes up to 180 seconds. So Drakus waits up to 180 seconds. So we will typically, after some time, it will drop into a prompt, and a kind of emergency prompt, and from there, at least on rail, I'm not sure how it is on Fedora, I believe it's but the same you have the right. SOS report command and stuff like that. So you have a nice, you have a nice prompt, and from there, yeah. <laughs> Until the GIF loops. <laughs> exactly. And from that prompt, you will be able to check which device is missing, and which device, that means if, if it's uh, the root device or swap device, so the device that are mandatory that you added to your kernel command line. Yeah. Basically, the debugging process boils down to, I know what the config says to look for. Is that there? That's pretty much it. If it's not there, then the search continues on for where did it go? Is it a simple uh, a configuration file alteration that went awry? Maybe we named it something uh, other than what we put into the config file? Or in some cases, especially for more exotic uh, uh, boot operations, uh, boot over uh, iSCSI and things like that, it might actually be gone. There's no network connectivity or, or uh, no SAN connectivity. 
there's a lot of conditions where uh, that is the next step that you want to go for. Um, so yeah, in a lot of cases though, the, the simplest step is when you're in that emergency prompt, take a look at those messages that Drake had spewed and start looking for where those devices are, where the file systems are, what logical volumes you currently have access to, things like that. Yeah, so a typical case where you will hit this is you rename your root file system your logical volume, or better say, volume group, because you found out your volume group was not nice. You rename it to, <laughs> from foo to bar, but you didn't update grub. In such case, the kernel parameter is still wrong, so Dracut is just, you will just wait for the device, and since it has the old name, it won't come up. Another case is when you are installing a system through Anaconda. Uh, if you are installing through the network and you don't allocate enough memory for the system to boot, to install, so on rail 7 or rail 8, you need 1.2 uh, gig of memory. If you just give one gig, it has no space to store the NitroMFS uh, and the NitroMFS stage two, and because of that, you have no root device. So if installing, always check that you have enough memory. And otherwise, that's what Kyle said. It's typically when you want to boot through the network through iSCSI or NFS and your network is down, typically. So how to fix this? Well, you can edit the Grub menu if you know that you rename your device, typically, and just modify it for one-time boot, and then later you will fix your etc default Grub. Or alternatively, if you don't know what's happening, you can, again, boot from the DVD and rescue mode and check your system, what is wrong with your state. So let's say Dracut completed. We have now slash sysroot, which is the root device from your disk mounted. What's happening now? That's when we switch root. Because up until now, we've been working out of, of memory. We've been working out of the initRAMFS uh, and the early, early boot uh, stages in the cases of initRAMFS not being accessible. Uh, but now we actually want to start the rest of the boot process. After that switch root uh, service uh, operation happens, that's where we, we start trying to bring all the rest of the complexity into, uh, into an online state. Uh, so first thing, systemd re-executes itself. That's subtle, but it's important to know because there are instances where the systemd that's in your initRAMFS is not the systemd that's on disk. It's rare, it's almost never a problem, but it is good to be aware of it because in some cases you might have subtle, odd behaviors where one version is running in the initRAMFS because it hasn't been rebuilt since an update of systemd. Um, uh, at this point, it starts using the real file system, uh, root file system, uh, it checks for the user entry and etcfs tab, mounts it. Um, Lucas. Oh. That's right, yeah. User is mounted in, in the initRAMFS. So it's one of the, the few uh, holdouts. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, from there it starts trying to find everything else. Uh, so we get into the, the FS tab, which brings us to the next point of executing generators. The really nifty things, the, the way that systemd does this is uh, ordinarily admins or, or users are familiar with creating unit files, creating configurations. Uh, generators are more geared towards dynamically creating units, dynamically creating configuration. The best example of this, or the most user-friendly example of this, is the etcfs tab. Um, there is a generator that runs early boot that reads the entries of the etcfs tab and creates systemd unit files, mount files, uh, for each one, so that it's then natively understood by systemd. Uh, and then it gets into the dependency tree, and we'll have some, some examples of where that can go awry later. Um, and then, one of the, the best parts about it is that it starts bringing services online, and it does so in a dependency-based manner. Uh, legacy systems 
had this wonderful quirk where, well, it was a feature, where one thing would start and then it would finish and then the next thing would start and it would finish and then the next thing would start and it would finish. And if you put a sleep anywhere along the way, the next thing wouldn't start until the sleep was done. <laughs> it was really frustrating because you'd be on this, this wild goose hunt through your, your service initialization scripts trying to find out why is it slow and why is everything else down. System D doesn't do that. The units and the, the uh, various different configurations components that it understands are tied together, uh, either via uh, requires or wanted by configurations that we'll talk about later or uh, ordering uh, uh, operations. What you get as an immediate benefit is a much faster boot because you get to tie things together that need to be tied together and don't tie anything else together. So here, now we go to debugging systemd, basically, debugging service initialization. So first, because we show you this, we'll have three points here. We'll show, we'll explain you, introduce you to systemd units and targets, and then we'll show you basic tools available to debug boot issues, and finally, we'll show you use cases. You can view it as a subset of the system. Um, it's really just the absolutely necessary bits of the system. But it's running system D also. Yep, it runs system D. Yeah. Um, the configuration looks a little bit different from within the init RMFS. So if you did something like uh, you added rd.break to the kernel boot parameter line and dropped into that environment, you're not gonna see the same services, units, and whatnot that you'll see later. Um, but yeah, it's all there, it's still running. Um, it's used as the primary mechanism for RHEL 7 and beyond and uh, modern Fedoras uh, in order to, to uh, implement that, that pre-switch root environment. So let's introduce a bit units and targets. So first, when you are dealing with systemd to understand all the machinery, there are wonderful man pages. So typically for units, which is a, it's a generic systemd object. You have the systemd.unit man page, and for every type of object you have, for example, services, sockets, you have the corresponding man pages with everything described, and examples, properties you can set, etc. So a unit is just a file. It's describing a systemd object. For example, you can have sshd.service, which describes the SSHD service, RPC bind socket is, which describe uh, the socket RPC bind will listen on for, more, for NFS mount, for example. And because of these files, so you have a kind of precedence to, to deal with because basically at the lowest level, you will have USR lib system D system and then your unit file that's what is installed by packages. If you want to do customization, then you will install your own files in etc systemd system, and this will just override the base file, etc. So the top priority is what is in run systemd system, then run systemd generator, and then etc systemd, and finally usrlib systemd. When systemd sees a file in one of the directories, it will just ignore the same file in the directories below. Alternatively, you can define drop-ins. So a drop-in, what is it? It's just a small file, a .com file, which enables you to customize a unit. Uh, for example, uh, you will want to, for a socket, HTTP socket, listening usually on port 80, if you want to change this, you can create a drop-in just to make it listen on port 81, for example. So it's the same hierarchy. That is, you have the same precedence, and this time, to create a drop-in, you have to create a file like unit.type.d and then something.conf, which will be loaded in alphanumerical order. For example, if you create a drop-in for SHD, you will create it 
in that path, etc systemd shd.service.d and then .conf. So drop-ins, we can also have drop-ins for main configuration file. For example, for the etc systemd system.conf file, you can create your drop-in in that directory. For the journal, it's the same. So there must be others, of course. And every systemd compliant tool should be able to understand this kind of drop-ins. And of course, there is some one page for that. It's maybe in systemd.unit, not so sure. I think it is. So some special unit you can have is targets. So usually a target is somehow similar to what you could have in, with init. That is a kind of synchronization point, or run level, for example, run level in init, run level five, which, which was uh, bringing up uh, the graphical interface. Here, yeah, so a target, usually it's used as a synchronization point. For example, you can add local fs.target, which is a special target that just says you must have, at this point to reach it, you must have all your local file system mounted, local file system from etc fs -tab points of view. You can have targets that don't have files associated that are all the systemd.special uh, um, targets that are described in, in that man page. So uh, initially, when systemd starts, it, we, we told you it creates some dependency tree. So to be able to do proper ordering, for example, if you want to start HTTP, maybe you will need the network. So you have to start the network before HTTPD. This is managed by keywords such as after and before to say, OK, my, my unit must start after another unit, and system L will try to, to manage to do that. Additionally, you can have requires and wants, which are dependencies on other units. So there's a difference. Require is a hard dependency, and wants is a soft dependency. That means that if your unit depends, say, on SSHD, it's a, and it's a require, if SSHD um, doesn't start, it will just die. And, for, but, and uh, it will really require it. So if you didn't install SSHD on your system, your unit won't start. With once, it's only if it's uninstalled that it will uh, be taken into account. And similarly, you can, you can install dependency using required by and, and wanted by, which is the same. So typically, when you want to have your SSHD service started at boot, which is not the default in some, some, on some services, on some systems, you will say, I will install SSHD, and by installing, you will, will say the multi-user.target, which is mainly a normal system behavior with our graphical interface, it wants SSHD, and then, because systemd will boot into that target, it will try to start SSHD for you automatically. If you disable that, your, your service won't start. OK, so yeah, here's just a, a quick example of pulling that all together uh, and very common uh, configuration that we see. Like here in the SSH daemon, uh, we have an after directive for network.target, not to be confused with networkonline.target. Um, because in this case, SSH daemon doesn't actually care if the network is online, it just cares that we're trying to bring the network online. Um, we also have it after the SSHD-keygen.target. That's a target that pulls together a couple of different things to make sure that the host keys are generated. So in one line, we've been able to say that it needs the network and it also needs all the things that set up your, your local host keys. Really powerful and also, Kind of subtle. Um, it's, it's good to be aware of what, especially the, the after and wants mean, uh, and also the difference between wants and required. Uh, because in a lot of cases, it's, it's easy to transpose them, but if you require something and your service fails to start for any reason, it's required by the other thing, and it fails to start. So it's, it's really good to be aware of the difference. Um, wants, sshd-keygen.target, 
it just wants that target. It's going to have as part of its wants uh, lookup operation that target. Um, and then also install wanted by equals multi-user dot target. That's just indicating that when we try and get to the multi-user uh, dot target, the special target, which is similar to run level three in legacy systems, uh, we want to make sure that the SSH daemon is there. Or at least that's what we do if we install this particular unit. Um, if you don't install it, if you don't enable it, um, none of that happens. And if you disable it, the inverse, uh, it's just removed. Um, and for more about how the boot works in, in this manner, because there's a lot of subtlety in how the, the various services and units all tie together and how this configuration kind of pulls the full dependency tree together, um, check out the man boot up uh, seven page. It's fantastic. It's got ASCII diagrams and everything. It's beautiful. Um, if you want to see customizations, so we talked a little bit about all of the, the drop-ins and the, uh, the, the prioritization of which configs override other configs and where they, they can be. That systemd delta is your friend because what systemd delta does is it checks to see what the, uh, the OS provided ones, the, the vendor provided uh, uh, configs look like and then it looks at what is actually running in terms of the drop-ins and the overrides and sees there's a difference here and it just prints that to the console. If you have weird behavior in a specific service and you run system D delta and there's a difference for that service, pretty good indication that you are on the, go, uh, the, the right path. Um, also, you have system CTL cat. Since all these files can exist in different places and there's drop-ins and everything else, system uh, CTL cat is great because what it tells you is what the end configuration looks like for your unit file. You run systemctl cat unit and all of a sudden you see this is what the config actually looks like because it pulled one config from the vendor provided files and then it pulled a, a drop in from Etsy. It's fantastic. Um, really, really subtle but important note because it kind of gets lost a lot of times. Um, after a change in a unit or etcfs tab, always reload systemd, especially if you, you change etcfs tab. Um, because of the generator behavior, how it goes ahead and, and loads the, uh, uh, the config, parses it, and puts it into unit files, if you don't reload it after the fs tab is altered, the new state isn't active. It could become active later, implicitly via enable operations or things like that, but then you get into a weird state at runtime and you, you always want to avoid that. If you make changes, always reload. Uh, a couple of other options that you have available, um, the really, really powerful ones, the really big hammer ones, are, the kernel, are mostly on the kernel boot parameter line, or the ones that we use in support work at least. Um, debug is great, it's read by a lot of things, it puts a lot of things into debug, quick note, um, if you have a serial console enabled, that means an awful lot of output is very likely going to the serial console, which can cause an awful lot of problems. <laughs> you want to do that carefully. Um, definitely an option, but you might have to reconfigure, tweak your, your serial console. Um, other options, systemd specific, we have uh, uh, kernel boot parameter options, which are documented in the man pages. Um, systemd log level lets us just set log level to debug for systemd. Uh, you have the log target here, which we set to k message, and log buff len for 15 meg. Uh, the last one actually isn't a systemd option, but it pairs nicely with the previous for k message, uh, because with k message, we're actually putting information out of systemd into the kernel ring buffer, and the kernel ring buffer by default on most distributions is fairly small. We want to increase it, so that's what that last option uh, comes out of. Um, and then systemd debug shell equals one. It's great. If you have weird problems that are coming along, it's great to be able to uh, I just add this to the, the kernel boot parameter option, uh, line because you get a, a console on TTY9. You can flip over and start poking around as, as the system's coming up. Uh, boot analysis, you also have systemd analyze plot. Creates a really nice SVG graph of all kinds of fun things gives you a lot of visibility into not only uh, how services were started, but how they, they parallelized and maybe where you have ordering problems. 
uh, a want, uh, uh, after or before kind of gets away from you, that will almost invariably but, display yeah. it right away. That was uh, called boot charts in the past. Yeah. It was, you had to rebuild uh, to enable boot chart. Well, boot chart actually gets yeah. you more information too. Yeah. You enable it. <laughs> it's sufficient. Actually. Yeah. It's sufficient. Uh, system D analyze blame. It gives you the critical chain and timings associated with it. Um, it's really great if you have a slow boot scenario. It starts telling you this particular service took forever to finish and it is ordered before this particular target. I need to start inspecting that. Why is it going wrong? Um, dump gives you tons and tons of information, basically all the running state as system D sees it. Um, uh, footnote being that uh, it's usually for experts because at that point it's emitting a lot of internal information that, that might give you a for, trying to find the forest for the trees type of scenario in, in uh, searching. Logs are great. System D journal starts really, really early in the boot. Um, and it's really resilient. Uh, so if you're looking for something that's going wrong and it may be scrolled by really fast, check the journal. Um, this, a couple of flags to keep in mind are dash B tells it that you want to look in this boot, um, not any others, uh, and a couple of output flags that are, are helpful for us in, in support work. Uh, short precise being that we want output that gives us a really high resolution uh, a timestamp for when the events came through because they can get out of order and it all looks the same when it's, it's uh, uh, resolved down to a certain decimal place. Uh, and verbose gives you an awful lot of information about the metadata that the journal picked up about the message because the message comes through and in legacy systems that was pretty much it. You got the facility and you got the message. In journal it also gathers other information like where the message came from in terms of services, com name, all kinds of fun stuff. So yes, when it, when it comes with a, some service startup failing, so we are not in the boot process anymore. We just you try to start a uh, service and it's just failing. You can just you can enable full debugging just for that service using that wonderful systemd log level environment variable, and then you just tell systemd to restart your service, and you will have debug only for that service, because if you enable it globally, you will be overflowed by, by, <laughs> by traces. Uh, otherwise, if it's, you can't find with the message printed by your unit, well, the, it's really a big hammer, but it works. You can just extract systemd. So you extract systemd, telling to follow the children using minus f, and then you start your service. You will see system A4, your service, et cetera, and you can just follow what is happening and try to find usually, you will see some, I don't know, permission denied or files or stuff, or stuff like that. On the EC Linux part, if something goes wrong, it doesn't boot your system. It, well, it boots, but there are some failures. It's good to try without and being in enforcing mode. So in permissive mode, so you just have to add enforcing equals zero on your kernel command line, and your system should boot. If it boots completely fine, that that's indicates that there is something wrong with AC Linux. Don't use AC Linux equals zero on the kernel command line. Why? It's just because it produces a mess. Yeah. Once you disable SC Linux, it's really hard to turn it back on right. If you just put it into permissive mode, you're okay. If you disable it, things that you create from that moment forward don't really get a context. So when you turn SC Linux back on, suddenly you have weird breakage creeping all over the place. Yeah. So now we have four use cases. Uh, the first use case is when you have a block device timeout. So typically you have some mount point which times out at boot. Uh, by default, the device timeout is set to 90, 90 seconds. It's, uh, it's tunable, of course. You can tune it on the kernel command line using that systemd.default timeout start sec equals some value. So it's a bit long, honestly, and if you don't have a US keyboard, <laughs> 
and you need to do the translation because you are inside Grub. It's in, in US keyboard, uh, US uh, key map. That's not so easy, but well, that's like this. So basically, every time you can put some value, you can put zero, which means infinite. But don't do that, because it's very dangerous. Say you have some, some local mount point that doesn't come up. Local mount point are supposed to, to start before SSH. If you set zero, it won't show up. You won't ever get a prompt to debug. So you can set it to a larger value, but don't set it to zero. Similarly, if there is only one mount point that fails, you, and you know that it's planned because, I don't know, the device is very slow, you can set up in FS tab for that mount of, uh, for in the mount options, X systemd device timeout to some value, or don't set it to zero because you will have the same issue. But generally, don't add netdev underscore netdev blindly to FS tab when there is something wrong with a device. It's usually wrong. So netdev has the effect of delaying your mount until the network is there. But uh, it's not necessary. So when can you have device uh, block device timeouts? It's, again, say you rename your logical volume or volume group, but you didn't update FS tab. You will have some device timeout when the system boots. So of course, if it's the root device, probably you would have hit the issue in the initram FS. But if it's some uh, OPT, for example, you wouldn't find it in initram FS. You can also have this issue if you say you remove the disk, but you didn't update FS tab. There is a mount point on it. You didn't notice it. You will get some failure on mounting the device. And hence, get the emergency prompt, because it's a local file system, typically. Uh, yeah, so this is another instance that we see very, very frequently. Uh, service is not starting at boot, but then once the box comes up, you start the service and it's perfectly fine. Almost invariably, you've got an odd ordering or timeout uh, issue that's, that's coming into play. Um, so checking for missing dependencies or checking for ordering issues, usually your first stop is your journal. Limit it down to just the specific service. That's what the dash U flag gets you. Um, so this is, basically means get me all the logs from this boot from this service. Um, check your config, because a lot of times, uh, uh, due to the, the way that uh, configs can be overwritten based on uh, reading out of Etsy, uh, systemd system as opposed to the, the vendor provided, you might have an unexpected end configuration state because of some uh, admin operation that happened earlier. Um, also check for jobs that are still being executed. Because the system is dependency-based, things tie together, you might actually have the system still working on it. You might see list jobs and see that there's some things that are, are currently underway. You can then start inspecting exactly what's going on with them, check the logs for them, all of that fun stuff. Uh, create a drop-in to delay the service startup if necessary. Systemctl edit is a nifty little utility. Um, it creates the drop-ins for you. So systemctl edit the service. It knows the the uh, uh, the read order for systemd, and so it'll put it in the right place for you. Yeah, uh, and then check if to see if the service unit is a symlink to a remote location. We actually see that a lot. Um, folks will put symlinks in place and then it's, uh, the, the unit file is actually on like an NFS mount or something. It's pretty good to be aware at, at that point that what, uh, that most of that config needs to be locally accessible. It, it shouldn't really need other, uh, undefined, uh, dependencies. <laughs> um, so yeah. Check the journal. Look for unit not found. You can get false positives, but, but yeah, this is an example. Cannot add dependency job for unit custom service ignoring, but unit not found. Sometimes you can have some random service not starting at boot. This mostly, so you boot once, you have some random service not starting, you boot another at the time. 
it's another service. So typically, this happens when you have ordering cycles. And in journal, you, you can check. So you need to check in the journal if you find something like breaking ordering or form dependency on with a stack. You're pretty sure that it's an ordering cycle. But in, because systemd cannot work with ordering cycles, it just will kill one of the job to break the cycle. And it, it does that dynamically. So basically, you, you never know which job it will kill. So this was some example. Usually, you, have, you, are, you create ordering cycles when you remount some remote file system. So here, slash SVC tools. When you remount it using a bind mount as a local file system. In such case, if you do this FS tab, because systemd is not aware that that bind mount is, in fact, also remote because it refers to an NFS file system. It will try to pull it very early, and it will create the ordering cycle. So in such case, that's the only, that's the only place where you will use NetDev to say, OK, this bind mount is a remote file system, so I will delay it. So we'll skip the demo because we lack time. It was not really interesting, and we can finish on that. Uh, yeah, uh, just an uh, uh, example of, of uh, AVC breakage that we see quite frequently. Um, uh, if you have those odd AVC messages that scroll by, not, not like one or two where it's coming online, but a lot, um, that's a pretty good indication that you have SE Linux problems that are, are baked in. Um, so yeah, uh, AU search dash MAVC is so just limiting uh, for uh, AVC events and uh, timestamp this boot iteration. Um, that'll get you the logs for this boot that indicate an AVC violation. Uh, and then journal CTL, uh, this boot, grep unlabeled, uh, or permissioned nine. Those will start indicating to you where a service failed because SE Linux gave a, a permission denied indication back. Um, these usually happen because, again, uh, SE Linux it was disabled at one time, especially if they're in the primary paths. Um, if they're in non-standard paths, uh, like a custom Apache web server or something like that, where the paths are different, it might mean that you have to start investigating uh, file context mappings in SE Linux and things like that. Um, this fix by using is RestoreCon. Basically says fix it all under the root file system, uh, and easier is just touching the auto relabel. That indicates to uh, service early boot um, to go ahead and relabel everything, and then just a reboot to get it started. And we're done. Yeah, we ate up yeah, most of our, our, our time. Uh, but yeah, any questions? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, do we have any special advice for debugging shutdown issues? Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the first things that I recommend is taking a careful look at the ordering uh, on startup, because the inverse is true on shutdown. Sometimes what ends up happening is uh, if you don't have enough of a, a dependency defined between two services or an ordering defined between two services, um, there might be a, a, an actual uh, requirement under the hood. Um, one that usually comes up is uh, like an NFS mount. An application is using an NFS mount, but the application is not ordered after the network or the remote file system target. On shutdown, there's the possibility that the network and NFS will be torn down before the application stops or attempt to. And then the job to stop the, the network fails because the device is still busy and all of those things. So the, the usual process or the recommendation is usually take a careful look at the startup, um, find out what is needed in order to get that service up, and then just follow the reverse. Yeah. If there's something missing on the teardown path, add it into the, the uh, startup path. So what can be very useful in that case is to set up a persistent journal so that on the next boot, you will be able to read what, what happened during shutdown until very, very late. Okay. I, th I think one more question. One. A quick, uh, quick question. Any tips about uh, debugging secure boot? 
Oh, well, we could talk after. Does that work? All right, I think that's it. <laughs> okay.